uh, three initial points at the outset. First, the Scriptures teach that just as there is a kingdom of God, there is a kingdom of Satan. Jesus, in defending his ministry and person in Matthew 12, says, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Satan has a kingdom. Secondly, many people don't realize the influence that Satan has. In fact, many people are completely blind uh, to the influence and presence of uh, Satan. The Apostle John says in 1 John 5, 19, We know we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. Satan has a kingdom. His influence is great. And third, people often respond to spiritual warfare and spiritual battle in one of two ways. Either kind of obsessing over it with an unhealthy preoccupation, kind of looking for uh, the, the work of Satan in every circumstance, every event, every conversation. Or people might respond or think about it with a kind of complacent indifference. I'm of the Lord. I have, I have no concern with these things. C.S. Lewis, in his work, The Screwtape uh, Letters, if you've not read it, I encourage you to do so, says, um, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, the human race, can fall about the devils, evil spirits. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And then he says, they themselves are equally pleased by both errors. Well, as we continue in Daniel, we see that in God's world, though it is a fallen world, in God's world and in the life of faith, there is a whole lot more happening than meets our physical eye as we live our lives. In fact, there is an invisible reality. There is an invisible world having sway and influence in our lives. And ultimately, it's for, for our good. So we pick up at verse 15 of Daniel 10. We have heard of Daniel in the midst of mourning. He's fasting, and there's this appearance, this revelation of an angelic being, this figure who comes uh, to strengthen him. So verse 15 of Daniel 10. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will then come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Uh, this has perhaps happened to you at one point or another in, in your life, or you've seen it in someone else. Or maybe you've, you've watched it on something like America's uh, uh, Funniest Home Videos. And that is a picture, a video of a person who is perhaps in their backyard and they're about to come into their house and they're about to take that step from outside to inside only to have their face uh, confronted with something very hard, uh, which is a very clear sliding glass door, right? And boom, they're down for the count. I'm not sure why we find these things uh, funny. They often appear quite painful. But sometimes our eyes struggle or fail to perceive what's right in front of us. Or we just simply don't have the senses to be able to see what is around us. 
Daniel's experience of encountering an angelic being, among other things, should wake us up and reveal to us this reality that goes far beyond uh, the human eye. What we see, touch, hear, does not capture the totality of the real world, of reality. Biblically, uh, we are surrounded by a world and in a world teeming with spiritual life and a spiritual battle that's taking place in the kingdom of our God. And that spiritual battle taking place in the kingdom of God is reflected in some ways in the shadow in which we live, reflected in the earth, in the here and now, as we go about our lives. Um, Our struggles and our battles through life and faith are in some ways like the aftershock Uh, of a great quake taking place in the heavenlies. And and this is the main point I I would hope uh, we grasp this morning. Since the Lord has opened the eyes of our hearts to the reality of his world, let us live faith-filled lives without fear, knowing that as we engage in spiritual warfare, we do so as those who are victors in Jesus Christ. The time frame of Daniel 10 here is important. We're told at the beginning of the chapter, it is the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. That year, we know, is 536 B.C. That year, we're told Daniel receives this word, this vision, in the opening of our text, from the Lord, and it centers on this great conflict. Well, a couple years prior, the uh, king of, of Persia, Cyrus, in the year 539, very important date in the history of God's redemption, it was that year when, according to the word of the Lord to Cyrus, a decree goes out that the first wave of the exiles in Babylon would begin to return to Jerusalem. And that's recorded, among other places, in 2 Chronicles 36, the last words of 2 Chronicles. And so the the first wave of exiles begin to return in, in 539, 538. This could have taken months. Some people suggest even up to or over a year to prepare and then begin that first wave of exiles in returning. When they return, Daniel is still in Babylon. When they return to Jerusalem... What do they do? Well, in the book of Ezra, Ezra 3 and 4, we're told the first thing they commit themselves to doing is rebuilding the altar so that sacrifice could be offered again for sin. But we also learn in Ezra 3 and 4 that their rebuilding efforts were confronted with tremendous opposition to the point that they stopped rebuilding for years. In the midst of this, we notice in verses 2 through 4, Daniel is in mourning. He is in fasting for three weeks, eating no delicacies, no meat, no wine, and that it was the first month, verse 4. This is the month in which God's people ate the Passover, including what the Bible calls the bread of affliction, that which they ate as a reminder of their deliverance from bondage in Egypt, remembering their bitter sufferings. So Daniel is mourning, he's downcast, either because he's overwhelmed by this vision, uh, this word from God revealing this conflict that he is about to endure or that is coming uh, down the line, or because he's deeply missing and he longs to be with God's people back in Jerusalem. Well, it's what happens next, and again later uh, through, uh, through the chapter, that reminds us of the kind of world and reality that surrounds us, and of which we are called to have the spiritual eyes to embrace and to live in light of. Here he is, verse 5, amidst his mourning, standing on the bank of the river, and he, it says, I, I, he says, I lifted my eyes, behold, a man clothed in linen, Belt of fine gold, face like lightning, eyes like flaming torches, arms and legs like burnished bronze, words like the sound of a multitude. Daniel sees a vision. 
It's an angelic being. The description is very similar if you are familiar with Revelation 1 or you take a look at it later, very similar to the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation uh, chapter 1. And there are Christophanies, there are appearances in the Old Testament of the pre-incarnate Christ. But it's likely not the case here. We, we learn of this angel that he needs help. He receives help from the chief of angels, if you will, uh, Michael, later. Uh, we learn about that in the chapter. This vision is not like the vision that he has had in previous times. Uh, those visions were from the Lord, but they were only in his mind. You recall the vision of the four beasts coming up out of the sea, or the vision of the ram with the two horns, the Medes and Persians, or uh, of the he-goat, the male goat with the one horn. Those were visions from God, but they were in his mind. This is different. This he sees with his own physical eyes. We're told there were those others who were with him who did not see it. They trembled and they fled. Verse 6. So an angel in the form of a man appears to Daniel. And just a couple days ago, uh, one of my children said, uh, Dad, there's these appearances of angels, including in, in, in Daniel. Um, do, those, do those still happen? And I kind of you know, squirmed around a little bit. Um, I said, well, it's, it's possible. I think it's possible. Um, maybe not common. Uh, certainly the, the Bible is a unique period of time in which God works in particular ways. But I would remind us of Hebrews chapter 13 in regards to that, where the author of Hebrews says this, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. I would also encourage you, I'm not going to go into it here, take the time to look at Hebrews chapter 1, in which the author is comparing the person of Jesus to angels, the superiority of Christ. But as he does that, he does mention angels and one of the roles that some angels have. Hebrews 1.14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Well, I'll let you discuss in your shepherding groups later, uh, the degree to which angels appear still today. But in hearing the angel's words, Daniel, in this fearful awe, falls to the ground in a kind of deep sleep, a stupor. And this is the kind of thing that happens when people are confronted uh, with, with the overwhelming power of God's presence. We think of Isaiah famously in Isaiah 6. He sees the vision of God on his throne, the train of his robe filling the temple, the angelic beings surrounding the Lord. And Isaiah says, woe is me. I am lost. I am a sinful man. My eyes have seen the king. Paul, on the road to Damascus, cast down by this radiant light, he meets the living Christ. Important points for us, the same supernatural reality that confronted Daniel and Isaiah and Paul confronts us, is revealed to the believer. And I'm not suggesting that we ought to be looking for or expecting encounters with angels in the form of men. Rather, to live effectively as followers of Jesus Christ, we ought to be living in light of the invisible spiritual world all around us and within us. We are Holy Spirit and dwelt people. The most powerful thing in your life you cannot see with your physical eye. No x-ray could detect it. No CAT scan could see it. This is the truth from Scripture. We should recall as well what Jesus said in John 3. Unless you're born again, unless you're regenerated, you can't see the kingdom of God. What does he mean? What does Jesus mean? You cannot see the kingdom. Do we see the kingdom? 
You cannot see. You can't know it or embrace it or value it or live for God's rule and ways without being regenerated, coming through repentance and faith in Christ. At the beginning of the Nicene Creed, it says, We believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Reflecting Paul's words in Colossians. So God created a world that is both physical and non-physical, incorporeal, ethereal, we might say, spiritual. And like man's rebellion against God in Genesis 3, the spirit world also rebelled. Which is why we read through the scriptures of angels as well as, as, well as the demonic. Evil spirits. You open the pages of the New Testament, Jesus setting foot in the beginning of his ministry, and the evil spirits come out of, it seems, the woodwork. They recognize him. They know his power and authority. And what Daniel is learning and seeing more of is this invisible world, this invisible battle, and yet one that is determining outcomes on earth. How important. Practically, to be living in light of this. There are things beyond what we see influencing and giving shape to the world in which we live. After Daniel falls face down, overwhelmed by the vision of this conflict, verse 10, the hand of the angel touches him and says, Daniel, man greatly loved, I have been sent to you. And he said, verse 12, Fear not, I have come because of your words. From the moment you began your prayers, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, an evil spirit, withstood me 21 days. Yet Michael, one of the chief princes, angels, came to help me. In the Bible, in Jude, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 12, we learn more about Michael. Michael is an archangel sort of the chief of angels. He contends with the devil, and he is especially called to care for the people of God. And here he comes to the aid of a fellow angel seeking, seeking to comfort and strengthen Daniel. All of this should be opening the doors more and more to the reality of the world that we should be inhabiting. We remember Paul's words very well in Ephesians 6 have cited them many times, referring to our spiritual battle amidst principalities, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, cosmic power, and present darkness. If a person does not live in light of the invisible reality, they will live more and more in what Os Guinness calls a world without windows where all that exists in their mind is the material world. Only what they see with their physical eye. It's a bit like living in the Truman Show, if you've seen that movie. A movie, a story about a character named Truman, who from his birth, youth, all the way into adulthood, without knowing it, was living on one big TV movie set. All of his family, neighbors, all the townspeople, they're actors. Everyone knows it, except Truman. A kind of reality show. Hidden cameras, they're placed throughout the town, all to capture his life and then to televise it to the outside world, the watching world. But he has no idea of any world outside his own town. He eventually discovers the greater reality, but... While living unaware, it makes for a very small life, a very shallow life. That's increasingly the lives of people in our culture. It's a closed world. It's a closed system. There's nothing beyond what you see with your own eye. Os Guinness, in his work, The Call, says spirituality for the follower of Christ is a matter of a different world, with a different reality, different energies, different possibilities, different prospects. Unseen spiritual reality is not unreal. In fact, it is more real 
decisive over the shadow reality of the seen world. A spiritual reality all around, above, and inside the secular reality of the world of our five senses. Spirituality is a dimension we enter only when we are supernaturally born into it and learn through the means of God's grace, through the disciplines, to make it our regular habitat. So a question for us is what world are we seeking to inhabit in our day-to-day? Is the world we engage merely a material one? Where all that matters is what we see with our physical eyes, touch with our hands, just our physical bodies. The battle we see among nations and political powers, that's really where it's at. Paul said in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Lord desires us to inhabit more than a physical world. So, some homework. Did you know you had some homework today? Take Ephesians 6, where Paul calls us to take up the spiritual battle, the central battle, And think about your life. Examine your life in light of the armor of God he calls us to put on in order to be about that fight. Ephesians 6, 11 and following. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand. Fasten on the belt of truth. The belt of truth, that is a sincere mind. A mind set on the things of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. That is devotion to a godly and holy life. Put on shoes or boots ready with the gospel. This is a life shaped by the gospel that is to protect you. The boots are protective to protect you in this world. Take up the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. These two things go together. Calvin, John Calvin says these two are of highest rank in battle. Right? We have faith, trust in the Word, and as we trust and give ourselves to the Word, we're guarded from the evil one. Well, as Daniel has committed himself through a lengthy exile to hearing the word, seeking to inhabit not only the physical world and nation around him, but the world of God's kingdom, it has come at a cost. There's been a cost, for sure. And I think this is something very wonderful and helpful for us. Daniel has been in exile for 70 years. He's probably somewhere around age 90. But he's still learning. He's getting to learn. I was thinking about my second grade teacher. We we would complain, do do we have to do that? And he would always say, Mr. Eshe, he would always say, no, you don't have to, you get to. Right? What a privilege it is for the Christian. We get to to continue to learn as we go on in our Christian faith, in our Christian life. That's what's happening to Daniel. But it is costly. The New English Bible translation of verse 1 captures this. Though the word was true, the word that came to Daniel, though the word was true, it cost him much toil to understand it. Nevertheless, understanding came in the course of the vision. On more than one occasion, we've seen through Daniel, he's overwhelmed, he's unclear about God's ways and and what he means, he's troubled at times, but God continues to reveal more and more and more to him. That's what we have in these last chapters, really the climax of the vision for Daniel. And you see the heart of Daniel in verse 12, the angel says, fear not, For from the first day you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God. That's that's what's required. That's the spiritual posture to be able to continue receiving and learning for us from the Lord. Unlike other prophets like Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah would be two good examples, who had these dramatic encounters with God, sort of interrupting their lives early in their careers, binding them, calling them to a particular service, Daniel has been more on a journey, finding himself in exile, yes, called by God, but more on a journey. He's picking up more and more of God's revelation and word and treasures as he goes along. 
He's kind of like the man Jesus spoke about in the parable of the pearl of great value. Like the merchant. The merchant was searching and searching and searching for fine pearls. And then he finds one. And he sells all he has in order to buy it. Daniel's picking up more and more and more. And now in these last chapters, it's really the climactic vision. It's revealing God's work, as we'll see, uh, to the end of history. For us, are we searching and journeying to see and discover more and more of God's works and ways and character? Two more things I want to point out briefly. One is how this chapter reveals the communion of heaven and earth. The conflicts and the tensions between earthly powers and God's people are reflected in the heavenly realm. They're being fought out there. Toward the end of the chapter, we see how both angels and people are involved in the same conflict. Further, Daniel's great struggle and agony while he's praying and fasting with conflict of soul took place during the very period of that great struggle in heaven between Michael and the prince of Persia. This should remind us our struggles and conflicts here on earth are part and parcel of a much greater battle that God and his angels are carrying out. Cool is the word that comes to my mind. I think it's cool. The Lord did not need to involve us as his people or use people like Daniel or like you or me in his great drama of redemption. But he does. He does. That we get to participate in what he is doing. And most importantly, as we do, the decisive battle has been won because we live on the other side of the cross and resurrection of Christ. The heavenly conflict that deeply, that most affects what happens here is taken up in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Seven and following. Listen to these words. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil, Satan, the deceiver, of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels, fallen angels, were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. And they, the people of God, have conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. The decisive heavenly war taking place in heaven, described here by John, is understood biblically to have occurred at the precise time when Jesus himself, in his death and resurrection, was engaging and defeating all the powers of evil in this earthly arena. This is why Paul says things like in Colossians 2, though you were dead in sin, God made you alive, having forgiven us all our sins, nailing them to the cross. And then he says he disarmed, he stripped the rulers, the spiritual authorities, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In Jesus' words, it is finished. Sin had been atoned for. The debt of our sin has been canceled. Our hearts cleansed. Reconciliation with God has occurred. Christ stripped and disarmed the power of the evil one to accuse us before God. And then God raised Christ up from the dead, vindicating him, overcoming our last enemy, death itself, that we would not live in fear of it or in fear of evil. And Christ as a living one rules over all heaven and earth. Yep, the evil one still incites, buffets, tempts, he hurts, But as we put on the armor of God, we do so as those whose end is secure, who have a glorious redemption, who know 
the end of the story. That's why we can sing. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how we continue to praise and worship you. We thank you for the beauty and preciousness of your word. We thank you, Lord, for your work of redeeming us and, Lord, for continuing to grow us in understanding of your marvelous works and ways. Indeed, Lord, you are one who is living, who continues to be at work, strengthening, guiding, sanctifying your people. We pray, O Lord, that you give us strength, that we would allow those words, the words that the angel said to, to Daniel, that they would shape us that we would fear not, that we would be of good courage, that we would know your strength and your power in and through us. Lord, give us the eyes to see that invisible world, that, that spiritual world and battle to which you call us. Lord, and give us enthusiasm and strength and encouragement, joy overflowing, Lord, as we live after you for your glorious purposes. Help us, Lord, by your grace and spirit to encourage one another in this. For this we pray, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing our closing hymn.